Welcome to the 18th video in the Marine Invertebrate Biology series. And this one is the third in the phylum Arthropoda. We're talking about crustaceans and ordered Decapoda, picking up where we left off. And we're going to pick up with reproduction. So generally copulation is the method of reproduction. Uh, they don't asexually reproduce. They don't broadcast for uh, broadcast spawn very often. Uh, some do, but for the most part, they will copulate. Uh, the male and female will find each other. Remember, they're mostly dioecious. And what they do is they will copulate. The uh, male will transfer sperm to the female, which is generally um, kept internally and in many cases can fertilize multiple batches of eggs. Uh, and often happens only when they're uh, when they're molting. And they females will generally brood their eggs attached to the pleopods. And if you remember the pleopods, those are the abdominal appendages. Those are the appendages attached to the tail. And then the young are released into the water to disperse when they hatch, usually um, uh, on full tides usually when there's a lot of current in order to get the maximum dispersal. And if you, this is a, a typical uh, decapod larva, that's called a zoea. They'll go through multiple phases, but they've got these um, wicked defensive spikes in order to keep them from being eaten so much. And also to help them from being, from sinking. When you have a lot of surface area, uh, compared to your volume and, and things like this, it's uh, especially the water is very viscous at uh, when you're very small, uh, and it means that you are less likely to sink. It slows your sinking rate anyway. And these things generally don't have a yolk sac. They usually have to feed in the water column. Here's a picture of crayfish, a freshwater crayfish in berry, and you can see the um, female with the eggs on the pleopods and she can keep them safe keep them oxygenated by fanning water over the over them but uh, they're much safer from predation so there's an energetic cost to carrying the eggs but obviously it pays off in the long run so we have two forms in the decapods the long-bodied forms uh, shrimp, lobster, and crayfish, and then we have other things that have short bodies like crabs. And the thing about these is that they have, even though a crab and a crayfish look quite different, they really do have almost uh, identical body plans. It's just that some parts of the body have been reduced and some parts elongated in a different species. So let's have a look. So here is the abdomen. And the cephalothorax, right here, cephalothorax. Should be familiar with those terms now. And what happens is in the long-bodied form, it sticks out the back and the long-bodied form like this. But in the short-bodied form, like the crab, it's tucked underneath. Okay, it's folded underneath and it's reduced but it's still present. Uh, and so, and often what happens is they still brood their eggs underneath their abdomen and the females will have a wider plate. So if you look at what a, uh, like a typical paddle crab looks like, then the male, the abdomen is still here and the female there, but uh, in the male it's reduced. And this is essentially just a, uh, 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 sperm transfer uh, device now still it's not really a penis it's, a, it's still the abdomen it's still got plates and everything and the females is wider because the female will carry eggs underneath there and there is a picture of a female paddle crab in berry so they will hold quite a lot of eggs the male the, and these ones do only uh, copulate when the female is just uh, just molted. That's the only time that her uh, shell is soft enough. So the male will guard a female for days, literally, when she's about to molt, and then impregnate her with uh, sperm, and then the um, 
carapace, the lower carapace or the exoskeleton will grow over the areas in which the sperm is encapsulated, but that uh, sperm can be used to fertilize in New Zealand paddle crabs up to five batches of eggs, usually three because it's seasonal, but it, it, it's kept and uh, it's just kept viable within these little compartments in the female's carapace for quite a long time. All right, so let's go to dendrobranchiata or prawns, okay? Very much like shrimp or prawn. They are shrimp, essentially shrimp and prawns. Um, some of them have very long uh, first chelate appendages on the periopods. Um, and they um, look a lot like, like um, lobsters, but then they don't have the massive um, first antenna. Okay. Uh, we'll just, that's really all you need to know. Um, Carida, Caridae. Okay. These are very similar to, to shrimp, but have different gills. Okay. You don't need to know about abdominal plates overlapping the plates on either side, but that is a, uh, a distinguishing feature used to identify species. Okay, um, only the first two periopods are chelate rather than uh, the first three, and, and they have enlarged periopods, often enlarged um, periopods, whereas the prawn or the shrimp don't. Okay, brachiura. So these are the crabs, the short bodied crabs, the true crabs. So as we saw before, the abdomen is reduced and tucked under. Uh, they're still decapods. The reason we call it all of these decapods is because they have five pairs of walking legs of periopods in all of these decapod species, which gives 10 legs, 10 deca, 10 legs, five pairs. Uh, and they usually don't have uropods. So in this case, this is an exception, they don't have the telson and uropods, or oh, they have the telson that's here at the end, but not the uropods. Uh, and you get some gr in really interesting uh, varieties. There's so much diversity in the true crabs. Like this is one called a decorator crab, very common in New Zealand. And they stick things, these little, uh, oh, they get these little outgrowths of their uh, exoskeleton, and they can, they will farm essentially they'll have little gardens of bits and pieces that they pick up sponge uh, hydroids uh, algaes and then they're uh, exceptionally well camouflaged okay the next one is animura infraorder animura still within the order decapoda um, remember what i said in the very first uh, day of class which was don't panic I know this sounds like an insane amount of terminology right now. Uh, this is something that you, with a little bit of uh, revision and flashcards and um, going back and over, you will remember this stuff. But for this one, you just really need to remember that they're hermit crabs, half crabs, and squat lobsters. I'm not going to ask you, uh, although this is interesting diagnostic information, I'm not going to ask you about the fifth periopod and whether it's reduced in animera compared to uh, uh, any other infra order. Uh, eye stalks run parallel to the antenna. I'm not going to ask you that, but just notice this as we're going through. This one is important. The abdomen is can be tucked under the thorax or spiraled to one side, and you'll be familiar with that if you when you start thinking. About how a crab might fit into a shell and carry its, uh, its armor around on its back. So the shells spiral, as you know, they kind of spiral around. And so to fit into it, the body of the animal has to, have to, has to spiral, or spiral around as well. And we know that these things are um, bilaterally symmetrical. They also have to shoot off to the side a little bit. And so they have developed this sort of uh, asymmetry where uh, the plant
explain the symmetry kind of just shoots off to the side a little bit rather than running straight up and down the body. But they are still bilaterally symmetrical. And this is a nice image of a glass shell where a hermit crab has uh, picked it up and fit his body into it, which is, and so we can see the whole body as it's, um, as it's fit into the shell, whereas normally you can't see, obviously, through the seashell. So you'll see that, in, and as we know from evolution, anything that is developed that is going to have a, an energetic cost. So this thing might be more protected if it had uh, a thick exoskeleton at the tail when it's transferring from one shell to the next or whatever, or if it's out of its shell for some reason. But uh, that is an energetic cost. So what it does is it tends to grow a very thick exoskeleton at the front of the body. So it's protected in the parts that are sticking out of the shell. But the part that is protected by the shell tends to be very soft and pliable and almost um, a, a, the, thin to the point of being very um, uh, soft and squishy, the exoskeleton at the back. But this is how an anemurid tends to look. All right, let's go to Palinura, which are spiny lobsters. Okay, the periopods are simple generally, except for the at the last periopod in females, they tend to have a uh, they tend to be chelate to manipulate eggs that are being carried on the pleopods, and they have these big first antenna. These are your classic uh, spiny lobsters. Okay, also the last synodae, the last synodia, sorry, uh, you're not going to be required, you're not going to be asked to memorize the infraorders the last synodia because they're uh, reasonably uncommon. I mean, you can go down to any estuary in New Zealand and find coast shrimp. Uh, they've got the one giant snapper uh, front claw and usually that is or that is it plays a defensive role but also it's a massive uh, display uh, appendage for uh, males next is the order isopoda and just a follow-up note on the um, don't panic and this massive amounts of terminology if you go to your theory book you'll see that um, there's a pretty comprehensive list of the orders, or actually the taxonomy of the arthropods, and especially the crustaceans. And uh, what you need to do is just um, look at the ones that are in bold font, and those are the ones that you'll be responsible for on the exam. Those are the ones that are most important uh, in terms of the numera, the the diversity of those species, how numerous they are, and how likely you are to encounter them in your research. Okay, so we're moving to isopods. These are the slaters of the uh, of the of the marine world. And you can see that they look a, a lot like slaters. They actually have uh, a um, instead of a single plate for their carapace, they actually have multiple plates on the carapace. There are the eye spots and the multiple plates on the carapace. But you can still see the uh, uropods and the telson here. Okay, so you still see the same body plan being exhibited with the exoskeleton and the uh, abdomen with um, multiple plates. Uh, slightly different in that the, uh, the, the cephalothorax has got pl multiple plates. Anyway, they are dorsoventrally flattened. So that means they're flattened from top to the bottom, the, dors the dorsal side to the ventral side, which you'll know from fish. They do a lot of scavengers, predators, parasites. Uh, they can swim. Uh, sometimes they're um, planktonic, but mostly they're on the bottom. They're attached to something. And there are terrestrial species as well, like the slaters, which you'll be very familiar with. So they come in all sorts of oddball varieties. Um, very thin, thin-bodied ones. Uh, 
uh, big fat ones like this. Uh, and you may be familiar with these if you are a keen fisherman. You may have seen these in the mouths of uh, some jack mackerel or even kawai. Uh, these things, in some cases, will are when they're acting as parasites, they will get into the mouth of a kawai or a jack mackerel and eat that fish's tongue and then act as the tongue for that fish. A good parasite doesn't necessarily kill its host unless it wants to be uh, go into another animal as it's uh, as an intermediate uh, if it's called an intermediate host but a, a good parasite if it wants to keep living it oh, it doesn't kill its host because then it, where is it going to live uh, so it actually functions as the tongue in certain fish in certain species of these isopods but they're very diverse one, this one's uh, um, a parasite that's actually not so uh, commensal as that uh, the one that eats the tongue. This one's actually set, uh, parasitizing the eye of this box. Okay, next one, Amphipoda. And I wonder if you can guess what these things are. This person is hopping off the sand. So they're sand hoppers. Okay, so rather than being flattened from top the bottom or dorsal ventrally flattened, these ones are laterally compressed. They're flattened from side to side. If you know where your lats are, they are on the side of your body. And there are some very uh, amphipods. They're called sand hoppers because they can tuck the pleopods and uh, or sorry, the telson and uropods under the body and then spring away. Okay. And lots and lots of diversity, so lots of different life uh, strategies. I didn't realize how long this video had gotten to, so we're going to end it here, and then we'll talk about the uh, syrupids on the next video to finish. Okay, thank you.